Welcome back, guys. I have an episode here from Fads. Not just you, everyone hates dating apps now. Get into it. So the other day, I was I was thinking about dating apps, right? And I was wondering how they were getting on. And it turns out that they They're are not. not doing great. Bumble's actually down uh, 92% since it first went public. And Match Group, the company which owns basically every other dating app, is doing pretty badly as well. People are falling out of love with dating apps. And this is affecting Gen Z in particular, who are becoming less likely to spend money on the apps. Because they suck and they don't work. Even when you pay for them, they still don't work. You're gate kept so you can spend as much money as possible. And all the matches that the algorithm knows would be good for you are kept behind paywalls. And even beyond paywalls, they're just kept away because... If you find your match and get off the app, they make no more money. In fact, Forbes Health ran a survey and found that 79% of Gen Z respondents had reported experiencing some form of dating app burnout. You might have even seen that the companies have resorted to some, some interesting marketing techniques. For example, Bumble got in trouble for some ads that they ran trying to convince women to, to no longer be celibate, I guess. <laughs> People weren't too happy with these adverts. Now, this is a far cry from the promise that dating apps made for us. When they first launched, it would be difficult to believe that around a decade later, they'd be launching $500 a month membership programs. If we try to understand how we ended up here, we maybe can come to some interesting conclusions, not just about these apps, but maybe about human relationships more broadly and the assumptions that we might make about each other. The first thing that's worth explaining is that the, the decline of these apps is in large part a, a signal of broader trends in technology. There's this idea of enchification, the phenomenon of online platforms degrading the quality of their services over time, leading to an overall decline in user satisfaction and overall value. This is something that's really broad across technology. It is best characterized through Airbnb, starting initially as a, as a promised land where you could rent out a spare room at the fraction of a cost of a hotel, but ending up in a situation where people are paying $200 cleaning fees and have curfews and service fees for a rental. The most egregious example of enchification is BMW, who in 2022 launched a subscription to just unlock no the heated seats that were already in the car. You got Dating it. apps are not immune to this problem as fundamentally they are technology companies. The most obvious manifestation of this enchification is the idea that subscriptions are king. I don't know if you know this, but <laughs> Tinder actually has three separate subscription options on top of the $500 a month subscription plan. These look more like insurance plans than dating apps. <laughs> dating apps have not become immune from this subscription mania. And their monetization strategy has led to them feeling more uh, more like a gacha game. If you, if you don't know what a gacha game is, uh, it's a game that uses like a loot box mechanic where players buy in-game currency and use it to gamble effectively. In fact, Tinder actually ruled out its own in-app currency oh, of course that you could use to buy special features that would increase your chance of finding love. It's a, it's a very huh. overt shift towards gamification, towards implementing game-like mechanics in a non-gaming environment. Uh, the literal CEO of the parent company of Tinder is a man named Bernard Kim, who was the former president of Zynga. If you don't know who Zynga are, they are the company that is responsible for all of the worst mobile games. You know, the ones that look <laughs> like this, right? And it's no surprise that these mechanics have been transferred directly from mobile games, which are some of the most addictive games in the world, to dating apps. This idea of gamification, broadly put, is simply just dr driving engagement and driving usership, not by providing a service, but by hijacking your brain's reward circuitry and making you addicted to the app rather than enjoying the app. As these apps have become increasingly gamified, people have responded to much uh, people responded negatively, obviously. But what's crazy is if you've actually used Tinder back in its heyday in like 07 or 08, 09, when did Tinder launch? I don't even remember. But if you used it in the advent of it dropping on the marketplace, wow, dude, was that revolutionary way to meet people. Not because it was the first to do the swipe function and all that, but because it actually worked. There was no pay to win features on there, or pay to play or any gatekeeping whatsoever. The app grew and exploded through word of mouth because it simply used probably a super simple ELO system. And maybe it didn't even probably have an ELO system back then. It was just very simple formula of how close is somebody to you? Are they active online right now? Show that profile first. Dude, the amount of matches, it didn't matter. You could be ugly as shit. You could still go out with people that were also ugly as shit too. You'd make dates for like all seven days of the week. It didn't matter. I had friends that were complete cave trolls, had multiple dates lined up throughout the week. No problem. Those same guys, if you were to put them on dating apps right now, some of them have already tried. We talked about this uh, years prior. This has been going on for a couple of years now where they 
gate kept all these features, but you'll be shocked if you get one or two matches. Some guys don't get any matches at all. It's fucking wild. And then like a meta culture developed around dating apps, like how you swipe. Guys were mass swiping, so then they cracked down on that. Uh, people were like installing bots or using bots to auto message and get phone numbers. And like guys were racking up like hundreds of phone numbers, thousands of phone numbers. It was fucking wild when Tinder hit the scene. Dude, it actually worked back then. Nowadays, fuck. You have to drop hundreds of dollars just to get a couple matches that are decent. Which how they would respond to an actual game by trying to, to exploit the mechanics of the game. In the world of dating, this manifests as hinge hacks. So there's this whole world on TikTok, which I didn't know about, of people sharing techniques and tips that you can use to make your experience of using dating apps a little better. Some of these things of include refreshing your Hinge feed by threatening to delete your account, which supposedly flags Hinge and makes you way more likely to show up in other people's feed. Um, other people's decisions have been things like choosing to use AI wingmen to create a profile that is optimized for these algorithms. And certification isn't necessarily a complete explanation, though, because despite the fact that many other services in technology have been getting worse and worse, the companies seem to still be doing great. And there are some, some unique dynamics of these apps that make them especially prone to collapse and that can help us understand the, the mass exodus. Part of it is simply the fact that these apps promote the idea that they'll literally change your life. Hinge, for example, markets itself as the dating app designed to be deleted, which is an extremely big promise. Uh, it's a promise that I personally, as a cynic, feel like uh, isn't necessarily true. Hinge is owned by a $9 billion company. So, you know, I don't think they uh, want you to delete any of their apps. I should mention that <laughs> I try to consult a variety of sources. And sometimes that leads you, especially with dating, down some uh, some uncomfortable rabbit holes. And so I want to maybe, maybe address a few preconceptions that people can often have after having had a bad experience with dating apps. They're not an enjoyable experience for anyone, regardless of gender identity. Around 80% of women report feeling some level of burnout and around 74% of males report feeling some kind of burnout as well. The unenjoyable experience is pretty evenly split across the aisle. We have some very different problems that occur, but no set of problems is one more significant than the other. Uh, interestingly enough, men outnumber women three to one on Bumble and Tinder, and yet women report higher rates of negative experiences. That's not to invalidate the fact that men obviously have incredibly high rates of negative experiences, but rather to emphasize the fact that nobody enjoys the experience of dating apps. Uh, yeah, because they're known as hookup apps, pretty much. If you want to meet someone organically and have a long-term relationship, you're not going to find that on Tinder. There are some women that are probably hopeful that the men they're meeting with the Disney mentality they have happily ever after that they're going to bag the CEO, bag the ball player, bag the famous musician, whoever they end up matching on there, the wealthy top one percenters of their area. They think that they have a shot of locking these guys down. So the burnout for women is literally going on dates with these high value men being razzle dazzled on all these dates and then pumped and dumped. Literally, once the guy busts one off, he's done. And it's the next chick for Tuesday, for Wednesday, for Thursday. So the top percentile men are, are literally getting the lion's share. I mean, the statistics bear it out for 98 to 2%. It's not the top 10%. It's the top 98 percentile. Okay. That means only 2% of men are actively getting dates and scoring. So 95 to 5 was what the data was saying as far as like successful matches. But I think the actual close rate of those 5% of men, 2% are going on these dates and getting monster numbers racked up. And that leaves you with what? 2% of males literally smashing the rest, bottom 90, no, not 90, let's just say bottom 60% of women, right? The lower 40%, those guys aren't even touching. They don't care. I mean, it's insane, dude. Like when I had Tinder, it was fucking wild. You could literally have one different girl over every single night. The match system was perfect. Um, the end shitification hasn't started. And the dating app culture wasn't poisoned with, you know, all these how to, how to hack this, things to say. It wasn't as robotic. People were still a little bit more normal. It hadn't entrenched in the culture just yet. So it was a cool experience back then. But today it's a nightmare. It's just a black hole. It takes you under, forcing you to bust open your wallet and make you more and more depressed that even with paid features, they won't give you match. And they do it on purpose. Bro, it's all for profit. It's uh, They don't care about your happiness. The more depressed they can make you, the more they can get you to spend anyway. It's uh, They have this shit figured out. They have the psychology of men and women figured out. The grass isn't greener on, on any one side. Men are far more likely to experience feelings of rejection, feelings of being ignored. Whereas it seems like the issues that women report are more... Well, they're different. They're different, at least, right? So a 2023 survey found that over half of women under 50 who'd use dating apps 
had been sent a sexually explicit message that they didn't ask for, which I think is an insanely high statistic. But generally, the issues that lead people to feel burnt out are more broadly the, the failure to find a good connection, being ghosted, being lied to, feeling rejected, and having boring or not substantive conversations. Now, let's, let's maybe understand a bit more about the, the user experience and what kind of leads to these super high rates of dis dissatisfaction and whether dating apps are actually benefiting from this or not. Because it seems like they aren't benefiting from this huge level of dissatisfaction that people are experiencing. I want to explain a little term from economics called adverse selection. Planet Money wrote a little piece explaining how adverse selection might be an important factor in understanding why dating apps have gotten so bad lately. It's possible that dating apps face adverse selection. Basically, a new app starts up and hopeless romantics looking for real love begin flocking to it. But so do sleazy types who lie on their dating profile. Over time, the earnest daters go on a bunch of bad dates, encountering people who have no interest in real relationships or whose profiles are completely misleading. Like lemons driving good cars out of the used car market, maybe sleazeballs push great catches out of dating apps and ultimately ruin the quality of the whole app experience. So people go to a new app in the hopes of finding something better. That's not really a problem because you could kind of, on the first date especially, or just their profiles, cycle through these kinds of people that would be bad. I mean, you have to be really clueless or, you know, starstruck in a sense by your match. Like they're so attractive, you're willing to forego red flags. That's not an issue. The issue is the apps themselves suck. They're worse than they've ever been. They demand more money than they ever have. And the user experience is worse because of it. And it's put off a ton of people that would have otherwise used them. Who wants to be on an app where you're limited to 100 swipes? Who wants to be on an app that asks you for like a basic membership just to be able to be shown everybody in your area or seeing who likes you or having to pay for a special feature where your like is pushed to the top of the other person you like's queue, whatever, so that they see you for like, it's so stupid. These dating apps would all get crushed. Listen, here's a way to make a billion dollars easy. Create a dating app, have a bunch of creators like me push that shit, get signed up, make the algorithm very simple. Just show the closest person that's active right now. And if they like you, show them. And if you like them back, let them match and speak for free. Show them app uh, ads every few minutes as they're using the app. Let the user uh, base swell up dramatically and then have shitty ass match group come and buy you for a billion dollars. Ta-da! You've essentially almost killed Tinder, Bumble, Hinge, all these gate-kept apps. That's why they're squeezing so much money out of people. It's a sign of desperation to ask 400, 500 bucks for that whatever Tinder bullshit membership that they're looking to ask for. That's because nobody wants to pay because your app sucks and you're squeezing water out of a rock with every client you have because you know they have the back end statistics, man, the usage reports. They know that their apps are dying and people would rather meet in any way possible apart from dating apps because they're not doing their jobs. Fuck, you might as well go on Instagram and DM somebody. It's better than this piece of shit. And the cycle starts again. This idea of adverse selection is basically the idea that people can take advantage of, you know, the meta on dating app to promote themselves as something they're not and ultimately lead honest, well-intentioned users to feel like the apps don't have any other honest users because they're only interacting with people who know how to game the app. This is this whole idea of, you know, hinge hacks or using AI tools to, to beat the system. It doesn't necessarily make you a better person on a date, but it makes you more representative of what the market supposedly looks like to someone who's just downloaded the app. And it makes people who download the app feel like everyone is awful. There is a way to actually minimize these bad apples. This is something that's actually been done before. If you can give the users as much information as you can, they can make more informed decisions, right? That's, that's intuitive. However, the more information you provide to those users, the harder it makes for the app to be gamified because they can't rely on the fact that you don't know things about other people. This is most clearly shown in the fact that Hinge's premium program, Hinge Plus and Hinge X, they both allow you to actually add more information about yourself. They allow you to filter your dates by location, by activity, and to fine tune exactly what you're looking for, which inevitably leads to a better dating experience and reduces this problem of adverse selection. And this isn't just theoretical. We can take the example of OkCupid, which has actually gone through a bit of a transformation from being a dating app that dealt with this problem of bad apples a lot better than the new school of dating apps into gradually becoming another Tinder clone. I found this comment of someone who described their experience, and I think it captures quite well what's going wrong with these apps. OkCupid used to be really great before they were sold off to match. 
matches the company that owns Tinder and Hinge and all of the other ones. It was a pretty simple concept that worked really well. Start people off by forcing them to answer at a minimum like 25 matching questions around things like politics, religion, handling money, hygiene, etc. Core factors that people would consider when dating, essentially. But the kicker was that you also got to specify how you would like your potential match to respond to the same question. And you got to weight that response based on how much you cared about that particular question. After about 25 questions, you could always get a large enough sample size to, to match people, but it worked best at matching people that had answered over a hundred questions each. It was like magic. Anyone with over an 80% match on that site always ended up being a surefire, amazing conversation. What this person is describing without necessarily realizing is this idea of adverse selection, right? The idea that just by having more and more information about who your potential matches are in terms of their interests, their likes, their personality, you can basically make dating apps be fantastic. However, the issue with that is that they can become a bit too good, right? And you end up in the situation where every person you match with is actually a pretty good person and you're therefore extremely likely to, to quit the app. The there it is. And that's the golden goose. If your app works too well and you meet somebody, that's it. No more money for them. That's why they've gotten very simple. They've gate kept even basic information now that you have to pay for to provide. Dude, it's all it's look at short term profit over long term gain. They These companies only care about making their bottom dollar today at the expense of you. That's why I say delete all these apps, man. They're fucking shit. And they cause nothing but mental health problems for everybody involved. They do not work the way they used to. If you're interested in creating an app like this and you want to go 50-50, I'm not a greedy dude. I'll pr I will promote the shit out of it. We'll consult. I'll tell you everything, how it needs to work. If you're a software engineer, or you know how to do software development, whatever like that. Just send me an email, bro. Let's get an app that only needs to do ads every five swipes or so so that we can pay for the servers and whatever else we need. And let's just do simple formula, like I said, that matches people the way I told you it needs to be matched. I got a bunch of contacts. I will make sure a bunch of other creators that are in similar spaces start pushing the app all over TikTok, all over uh, YouTube, wherever the fuck, Instagram, it doesn't matter. We'll let word of mouth do the rest because the app will be functional. And then we'll sell it for a billion dollars to retards over at Match Group. It's ridiculous. It says, why can't a nonprofit make an app that is actually meant to be deleted? Not everything in this world needs to be run by for-profit companies. And that's another thing. You can make the app extremely successful and the app will only continue to get bigger and bigger. Do you know why? Because not like a percentage of the people that you meet, what are the like success rate of that? So you can go on a bunch of really good dates, but months down the line of vetting, you may see like this isn't a long-term potential match. So you call it a day and you're going to right back on the app because the experience was so good. Most of these people will be a revolving door naturally until they meet the one. And if they met the one, they will do nothing but spread the word and tell you and all your friends how they met the one through the app and you should, uh, they recommend that you download it and use it as well. It's, it's greed, bro. Greed is destroying the business model. Greed is destroying this country right now. Always greed. Anyways, let me know what you guys think and we'll see you on the next one.